number two. Mark chapter number two, verse one, we'll be reading uh, today, continuing our series, the four-word series, and uh, you are welcome to follow along on the screen or in your own Bibles. Uh, I'll be pulling mine from the message translation this morning, uh, but Mark chapter number two, Mark is one of the synoptic gospels written, uh, many people think the first gospel that was written. Uh, by one of the eyewitnesses, uh, folks who follow uh, Jesus. This is thought to have been the encounter of Peter uh, that was written by uh, one of his uh, scribes and friends and, and, and confidants. And uh, we find this to have been written, I believe, less than 30 years after the death of Jesus. So we have uh, the, the account of what... Uh, Folks heard and saw with their own eyes. Uh, so significant and so powerful uh, this account is because there would have still been people who were alive during that time who would have been able to dismiss it or call it into question. And I think all these things are important because how many of you know all the time during Christmas and Easter, you always get these Discovery Channel series asking like, who is Jesus and where is Jesus and why do you believe in Jesus? And it is always important to appreciate that uh, the tradition we have, the faith we have, is not just you know kind of pulled out of the air, but we are actually recounting and reading the eyewitness accounts and testimonies of those who actually walked with Jesus and saw Jesus do these uh, amazing things. Um, and I believe that if he did it before, he can do it again. Amen? Uh, so if you believe that God is able, uh, then these words should be a wonderful, wonderful gift to us today. Mark chapter number 2, verse 1, uh, the word says, After a few days, Jesus returned to Capernaum, and word got around that he was back home. A crowd gathered, jamming the entrance so no one could get in or out. And Jesus was teaching the word. And they brought to him a paraplegic person, a man, carried by four men. When they weren't able to get in because of the crowd, they removed part of the roof, dug through the roof to lower the paraplegic on his stretcher, impressed by their bold belief, impressed by their faith. Jesus said to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive your sins. Some religious scholars, scribes, Pharisees, and all the holy righteous folk, uh, sitting there, started whispering among themselves, he can't talk that way, that's blasphemy. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew right away what they were thinking and saying, why are you so skeptical? Which is simply to say to the paraplegic, I forgive your sins, or say, get up, take your stretcher, and start walking. Well, just so it's clear that I'm the Son of Man and am authorized to do either or both, he looked down at the paraplegic and said, get up, pick up the stretcher, and go home. And the man did it. Got up, grabbed the stretcher, walked out with everyone there watching him. They rubbed their eyes in prejudice. And then praise God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to speak from the topic simply today. Uh, forward together. Forward together. Follow in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them let's move forward together. Let's move forward together. Now, one of the greatest lies and fallacies that we have bought into in this modern moment is this idea that you and I can go alone. That we are in and of ourselves all that is necessary to accomplish all that needs to be accomplished. That in many respects we are an idol. This idea that you and I in this present age don't have to depend on other people that we can pretty much and move throughout the world, relying on our own strength, our own ingenuity, 
ago. You know, every man felt like that, right? I don't know about it, right? It's just, you know, I just, you know, I, 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 got, I got it on my own. Many of us uh, may think or may know folk who think that the strength they have is adequate, that they can bend the will of other people using their own strength. Bend the will of the world using their own strength. That they underestimate the need, the necessity, and the power of being and living together. I don't know about you, but it is a blessing to be able to live with folk that you can laugh with, yes, that you can cry with. Yes, Sometimes you can even lie with. Just tell, tell half truths, praise God. And they know you lying, but they still willing to ride with you. <laughs> hey, man, somebody say amen, right? Well, you know you lying. You ain't got to lie, Craig, right? It, it, it's, it, it's a blessing to have folk that you can share your life with. Because no matter how powerful you think you are, how much skill and money and notoriety and fame, how much wisdom and learning you have. Moments in life will always present themselves to remind us that no matter what we have, no matter who we are, we are at the end of the day still human. And to be human means that we have limitations. That we can't just move throughout the world without boundaries and without certain kinds of things that make it impossible to do and live in the world alone. And I want to submit to you today that part of what this Christian faith, this precious gospel we have, has been given to us to remind us that you and I cannot make it alone. That there will be moments in our life where our strength will be enough. There will be moments in our life where our strength will be inadequate. And even those moments in our life when it seems like our strength is enough, that is a very temporary reality. Amen. And sometimes, eventually, you're going to realize that moving forward together is critical to accomplish the God idea, the God mission, the thing that is so big you could never do it on your own. Amen. Now, this past weekend, all of us uh, may have been aware, should have been aware, that to the 50th anniversary of the Selma uh, March Bloody Sunday actually being celebrated today in Selma, where a number of individuals were able to band together and accomplish something that would not have been possible if they were doing it alone. Now, clearly in history, whenever the story is told, the story is often essentialized in a single person. And people often put their gaze on that one person, and many folks' stories and many folks' uh, presence and contributions are often not intentionally erased, but often minimized. But in the the, the, the historical account and recollection and celebration and commemoration of the Selma experience. It helps you and I to always see the power of why we can't keep telling our stories. Because how I many know when you're not telling your story, then your story can often be told by somebody else. And how many of you know when other folk tell your story, they may be not parts that are important to you. I wish I had a church this morning. Amen. Amen. How, how many of you know that the, the story uh, of anything is told differently from uh, the person who got the victory and the person who got the loss? Amen. Amen. They can experience the same thing. Amen. But, but whoever wins or whoever loses can have two totally different interpretations of what happened. Amen. And part of what I believe you and I must never forget is why it's important for us to tell our stories of triumph and defeat. Yeah. Because they show and remind us that with memory and with history, we can always be positioned for the future reality that 
that God has set aside for us. A people with amnesia can rarely have the ability to see ahead. Because you don't have anything to build off of. But I'm convinced that when you have a sense of your history, your history and your story can help sustain you in your present. And propel you to a God-filled future. My brothers and sisters, we find, particularly in this historical account of Selma, I was so moved and fascinated by it because even though Dr. King and a few other names are often lifted up, there were some obscure names that uh, uh, died that weekend, died during uh, the activities of Selma that are not often lifted up. And their names, Jimmy Lee Jackson, Black Baptist Deacon, who was shot and killed by the police. James Reed, a white Unitarian pastor who came from a whole other part of the country to participate in the weekend events. Viola Luizo, uh, a, a white lay woman from another congregation, I believe, in the northeastern part of the country. And then you had Jonathan Daniels, who was a seminary student, a college student, a clergy person, a deacon, and a regular church member all converged, not knowing each other, in Selma. And they all died that weekend collectively. Pushing for a shared value of freedom. Their deaths in isolation may never be remembered by most. But because they died together, I want to submit that it rings out in a further reverberating manner for all of us looking back to appreciate that the deaths of Bloody Sunday remind us that even when we're dying together, it has an impact far beyond us dying alone. And even when we're living together, it has a greater impact than when we're living in isolation alone. Christianity, this faith of following Jesus is never intended to be practiced alone. Amen. Amen. And this is countercultural, yes. counterintuitive to the way we've been shaped in the world. Emmanuel Kant, back in the 1700s, he, he, he had these ideas around individuality and how uh, people's minds and, and, and our destinies are ours to forge. We don't need the input or authority of others. It is called the categorical imperative that I am my own truth and I am my own authority. And over the years it has caused the radical individuality that works itself out. Not only in our human relationships, but even in our spiritual relationships. The people find it hard to move forward together. But I want to submit to you, my brothers and sisters, that when you are in touch with Jesus, you don't get to pick and choose who's connected to Jesus. Right. Uh, I know for some of us, you know, that don't seem like that big of a deal. How many of you know that there is great value in God choosing who's in the family of God and not you or me? Yeah. Amen. Because depending on how you make me feel today, I may just write you out. <laughs> I wish I had a <laughs> <laughs> Don't you use You are outside. <laughs> we ought to thank God, Lord. I thank you that it does not depend on me or the person sitting next to me, but it is all the work of God. Amen. This is powerful. This idea that moving together requires the we. President Obama, in his speech yesterday, powerful speech, you know, the president is gifted in moments, I think, of channeling the greatest ideals and aspirations of who our country intends or tries to be. One of the great lines that I found in the speech, he said that the most powerful word in our democracy is we. This idea that we, the people, we, the community, we have the ability to move forward together allows us to accomplish much more than if we tried to do it by ourselves. Yes. Now be clear, this we is a very tenuous word in human experience because often there are power dynamics at 
play when we try to define who the we is. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. Now understand, when God, amen, is speaking to us and calling us to live in the, as Dr. King says, beloved community, amen, there's a table, there's a seat at the table for everybody, but how I many know in our world, in our systems, even in our families, the we can be really smallly defined. Amen, amen, amen. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's so important for you and I to make sure that if no one else in the world is struggling to move forward with a robust orientation toward the we, it is the church. Yeah. Yeah. It is a struggle Come on, Pastor. to live with a we that is big enough for everybody. Because, yeah. you know, uh, the we that Let's people come that you sometimes are trying to get away from. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and all of us got our circle of we that we like. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. All of us. But when you are in a relationship with Jesus, how many of you know if Jesus right hand is holding one part of the we and his left hand is holding another part of the we? Then those two we's are connected through Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't get to tell Jesus, don't hold that head. We don't <laughs> like that kind of we. Uh -huh. <laughs> Moving forward together affords you and I to lean into this truth. There's great power in the we. And this is one of the great uh, truths that come out of our text today. You see Jesus at home preaching. It's almost a homecoming. And Jesus is in a house, and the scripture said that the house is filled so much where no one else can get inside. And people are, are in the entrance, and they imagine them sitting on the floors, and folks are just outside, and, and there's no room for anyone else to get into close proximity to Jesus. And you have a paralytic person who is uh, obviously made some that they want to go to where Jesus is. But the physical limitations of this man or the obstacles that are external to this man yeah. make it impossible for him to get to Jesus on his own. Mm -hmm. So this man has to rely on four of his friends yeah. to bring him to Jesus. Yeah. It is not the case that Jesus is never It becomes a strength and a blessing to know that I don't know. 
vulnerability of our existence. This idea that human suffering is one of the greatest characteristics of what it means to be human. That you and I are going to go through things that make us scratch our head and make us ask God the why question. Make us ask God, why is this happening to me? I've lived right, I fasted and prayed, I fed the poor, I clothed the naked, I walked on water, I raised the dead, I healed the sick, I paid my tithe, I spoke in tongues, swam from the chandelier, sang in the choir, ushered, preached, and I did it all over again. <laughs> Amen. Anybody ever gave your resume to God? God did all stuff again. What's up? Maybe that's just me, praise God. <laughs> in my quiet time with God, tell, tell God all the reasons why they should be sick and not me. <laughs> they should be broke, not me. Yes. It's just me, I know. I'm preaching to myself. <laughs> but even in those moments of human suffering, how many of you know it creates an opportunity for divine intervention? Yes. Yes. So don't despise the challenges and trials you're going through. Yeah. The scripture says, count it all joy when you're going through it because it is working something in you that only God can work out. Yeah. says that in your weakness, Christ is made strong. I don't know about you, but I can't wait for the strength of Christ to show up yeah. whenever he gets ready. Because yeah. when Christ is strong, how many of you know you got everything you need yeah. to win your battles? This young man, depending on the strength of his friends, is brought to Jesus together. And it is these kinds of lessons that I believe the scriptures lift up for us. If we're going to move forward together, the first thing we must have is a commitment to community. Everybody say, commit, commit. to community. Commit. Say it again, commit, commit. to community. Commit. Living together in relationship with one another. It sounds great yeah. when it's with people you like. <laughs> yeah. When they like what you like. Yeah. Eat what you eat. Wear what you wear. Watch what you watch. Listen to what you listen to. Oh, I'm committed to that kind of community. <laughs> I, I love that stuff. But how many of you know that's not what Christian community is about? The fact that we are still largely segregated by race and class, political affiliation and location. But yet we declare that we are the body of Christ is one of the most shameful public witnesses to a world. Yeah. 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 That Christian community means that I got to be willing to commit to being next to you even when I don't like you. <laughs> when you were my last night. <laughs> That's the last night. I'm talking about like you, you don't just you stopping on that last night. And you have the choice to opt out of that community. Christian community pulls you back in. Says that no, oh, you gotta stay right here. Christian community, living in this kind of community, means listen, that you have to learn how to live at the center. Huh. Now, you know, I, I can preach a whole sermon on the center and the margins, uh, but you just gonna have to take my word for it or go through our Way 101 and you'll hear, hear, hear more about this. But we, we teach this in, in our Way 101. The, the ways that Jesus engages in relationships and community. That Jesus is always living at the center. And we that are engaged with Jesus are always living at the center. But we also have to learn how to live on the margins too. Yes. And Jesus engaged the crowds. This is kind of similar to this story. Right? Where Jesus is working 
singing and, and engaging folk. And crowds of people come and they interact with Jesus. These are circles of intimacy and they all play themselves out differently. But if you go one circle in towards the center from the crowd, you see that Jesus interacts with the 70. And in Luke chapter 10, you can read it on your own, Jesus collects the 70 and he sends them out two by two. After training them and empowering them, he sends them out and he says, go and proclaim this gospel. Then you go even closer towards the center, Jesus is dealing with the 12. Those are his disciples that hang out with him all the time. Three and a half year of ministry, Jesus has 12 folk rolling over him while everywhere he goes. He sleeps outside, they sleep outside. He sleeps in folks' homes, they sleep in them home. He's feeding folk, they're helping. He's serving folk, they're helping the 12. Then you have even inside the 12, the three, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Jesus was still that living at the center and at the margins. And I want to submit to you that when we move forward together, it can only happen when we have more of us that are skilled at living at the center and at the margins. Are y'all checking with me this morning on this? There are certain folk who are living on the margins that require our engagement. People who may not fit anywhere else. But can we always create space for them to fit in the family of God? That God Who we 
know and sometimes don't know. You know, asking for alms, asking for help, asking for support. How many of you like me? Sometimes you 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 see them, and then all of a sudden there's something that grabs your attention. I don't know. You start playing with your radio. <laughs> oh, somebody's texting me. <laughs> but it takes courage to not look away from the hurting in the world. It takes courage to keep your eyes fixed on the things that you know need to be addressed. And it's not always things external to us. How many of you know there's some things inside of us that require the courage to not look away? There's some struggles and some hurts and some pains inside of us that require us to have courage. And it is this kind of courage if we're going to move forward together, we must tap into so we can have concern. What is concern? Uh, the word that I love to use for this is called empathy. And empathy, if you take a look at this, this uh, definition we pulled, it requires that you step outside your own emotions to view things entirely from the perspective of the other person. Yeah. Think about this for a second. Because how many of you know we are not shaped to have an out-of-body experience yeah. at the expense of somebody else? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Ain't it something that Jesus, if you look at his life, modeled this magnificently from his time in eternity as, as living in fellowship with the triune God. Scripture says that he will of privilege, willingly emptied himself out and took on the form of a servant, of a human being. And the scripture goes on to say that he learned obedience to the death that he suffered, through the things he went through. Another passage of scripture says that he then has passed into the heaven as the great high priest who is not unable to be touched by the feelings of our own infirmity and weakness. Why? Because Jesus made the greatest act of empathy yes. in his time. Yes. He voluntarily yes. stepped outside of himself. Yes. So he can understand why the tears roll down your face when somebody dies. So he can understand what it's like for that homeless brother and sister who don't have nowhere to stay. So he can understand what it's like for some of us who don't have food to eat and our stomachs are proud. So he can understand what it's like to have those closest to you betray you and leave you all by yourself. He went through this experience of empathy. Why? Because Jesus understood that if he was going to die for the sins of the world, and bring everybody together with him into fellowship with God. It had to start with courageous concern. Yes. Not concern of his own well-being, but the concern of others. Yes. My brothers and sisters, what would the world look like? What would your relationships look like if we lived with that kind of courageous concern? Yes. If I thought to think more about what my brother and sister may be impacted by in my decision making, Rather than always being overly obsessed with myself. Yeah. Ooh, I know something like, oh, Pastor, you ain't lived the life I live. You ain't been around the people I've been around. I found human beings all the same folk. Yeah. We're selfish, we're greedy, and we are about self preservation. <laughs> but Jesus, when he comes into our life, balances that out. Because yeah. he says, listen, your measure of love. For me, is about how you treat the least of these. Yes. Amen. Who have you visited in the jails and the hospitals? Who have you fed? Who have you clothed? How can you move with great concern? These friends of this paralytic man, obviously, I don't know if they had their own needs they needed to be met. I mean, obviously, Jesus in town healing folk. Man, I kind of want to get next to that even if I don't need no him. Amen. <laughs> there may be some stuff I don't even know that's going on. You know, it's like, all right, you know, you handing out that healing. Uh, does that mean he get close? But they suspended their own well-being 
for the well-being of their friend. And I just wonder, where in your life are you being called to be so committed to living in community that you can have courageous concern for those in your life? Can I think of a few places like that? Amen. There's some people in my family that I'm just, you know, it, it, it's going to take some courage for me to love them. My, 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 my children are going to take some courage. We love these rascals, praise God. Folk on my job, folk in the community, folk in these systems of the world. But you and I aren't asked to do it through our own strength. That's to do through the power of God and through the togetherness of our community. Yes. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them I have the courage to be concerned. Tell them that I have the courage to be concerned. And when you and I move with the concern grounded in courage, I believe it allows us the wonderful gift to experience holistic healing. Yes. Everybody say holistic. holistic. Healing. 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 Say it again. Holistic. holistic. Healing. healing. My brothers and sisters, listen now. All of us need to be healed in many places at the same time. Some folk have a hyper awareness of their physical needs, but not their spiritual needs. And others have a hyper awareness of their spiritual needs and not their physical needs. But when you come into relationship with Jesus, he understands that there are many things that are not well in us. And he is always trying to help us have holistic healing. In this story, you see Jesus uh, addressing the many needs of this man. First he says, listen, your sins are forgiven. Oh, and then here come the haters. Yeah. And so That there's some 
other things that you got to do as well. Jesus told the man, pick up your bed and walk. Obviously, this paralytic man who had to be carried in by these four individuals was able to pick up his bed and they all walked out of there together. Four walked in, five walked out. The power of their faith together allowed them to do much more than what they were able to do alone. And my brothers and sisters, you and I must be people who are always aware of how God wants to heal us totally, not partially.